Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Andre. We're going to start with some technical details because we have people joining us by webinar just to make sure the webinar is working. Uh, first, I want to let people know that we're recording this webinar and we're going to have it online within 24 hours. Uh, second, everybody who is joining us by computer, please make sure your, uh, uh, your microphone is muted or if you're joining by phone, make sure your phone is muted uh, and you can use star six to mute your phone. Uh, if anybody will need technical assistance while we're going along here, uh, Nicole is uh, going to be running the webinar from her computer. And uh, let's see, you can, uh, in the bottom left hand corner of your screen, there's support numbers and star commands you can use to get uh, technical assistance from Nicole. Uh, and just to make sure everyone is comfortable with the technology today, again, this is particular for people online, um, can you please raise your virtual hand? And you'll find the symbol at the top left side of your screen. Looks like a button of a person uh, raising their hand and beside the speaker symbol. Okay, so Nicole's showing that everybody is, yeah, that's working out. So that's excellent. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, and finally, I guess I want to uh, point out that there's a chat box on the screen. And uh, please take this moment to uh, Introduce yourself to the other people joining online. You can uh, put your name and uh, where you're from, perhaps, in that chat box. And also feel free to ask any questions as we go along. Put them in the chat box. And I'm sure they will get relayed to me and to the panel. And we'll include that in the discussion for this hour. Uh, and for those physically present in the meeting, we're going to have a microphone that we pass around if you want to ask any questions. We're not amplified in the room, but please make sure you're using your microphone so people online can hear you. Thanks. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, welcome to this Suffice webinar called Faculty Voices, Stories and Lessons for Improving Your Community Campus Partnership. Uh, within Suffice, we understand community campus engagement and community campus partnerships quite broadly. We're talking about uh, community service learning opportunities for students, whether undergraduate students or graduate students in colleges and universities. Uh, we're talking about uh, community-based research projects, either undertaken by students or by uh, faculty members. <clears throat> and we're also talking about some of the other ways that uh, campuses connect with local communities, whether it's use of facilities, space, recreation space, library access, and all of that. The ways that uh, campuses can be part of anchor institutions for local economies, even. Uh, all of these different ways, <clears throat> excuse me, different ways of connecting have something in common in that they're all involved partnerships with external organizations and the need to kind of define common objectives with those external organizations. And so that's the, the common connector that we're going to talk about. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be looking at um, faculty, pers <clears throat> faculty perspectives on community campus partnerships. And so we'll primarily focus on teaching and research, because that's really the, the main place where faculty members come in. Um, and I have with us uh, four, three other members of the Suffice Project. Uh, Nadine Changfoot to my right, Dr. Charles Levko to my, the right of Nadine, and Colleen Christopherson Cote. Um, and uh, both Nadine and Charles are professors, and Colleen comes from the community side of the Suffice Project and is going to be uh, giving some feedback on some of what she's hearing from the faculty members today. Uh, so Charles Levko. I'll introduce him on the far right first, is a Canada Research Chair in Sustainable Food Systems at Lakehead University. He's been involved in community food security and food sovereignty efforts for over 15 years as a practitioner and academic. His research uses a food systems lens to better understand the importance of and connections between social justice, ecological re regeneration, regional economies, and active democratic engagement. In the first phase of Suffice, suffice <clears throat> he worked as the academic co-lead of the Community Food Security Hub and has continued his work as the academic co-lead of Suffice's Community Campus Engagement Brokering Initiative around food sovereignty across Canada. Nadine is an associate professor of, in political studies at Trent University in Peterborough. She engages in arts-based research and community campus engagement. She was academic co-lead of the Suffice Community Environmental Sustainability Hub in Peterborough, Halliburton, in the first phase of our project and collaborating with Abbey Gardens, the Halliburton Highlands Land Trust, and Peterborough Greenup, among others. And she's currently a member of the Suffice Evaluation and Analysis Working Group. And Chris, Colleen Christopherson-Cote, to my left, is the coordinator for the Saskatoon Poverty Reduction Partnership. 
Saskatoon Early Years Partnership and a community co-lead for the evaluation and analysis working group at Suffice. She works within Saskatoon, Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. Uh, the interconnection between all three partnerships provides her with the opportunity to catalyze, convene and coordinate community-based work to drive change and build capacity around improving the lives of vulnerable people in Saskatoon. And uh, I am Peter Andre, I'm the principal investigator on the Suffice Research Project and I teach in the Department of Political Science here at Carleton University. So we're happy to have you here today. Uh, we're going to be sharing um, lessons that comes out of over 40 partnerships that we supported through the first four years of the Suffice pro Project from 2012 to 2016. Um, and uh, originally we pulled together last January uh, a group, half academics and half community organization representatives who were involved in those projects through our first four years to help interpret the results and, and give some guidance and recommendations for different kinds of actors, post-secondary institutions, faculty members, community organizations and otherwise coming out of our, of our work together. And uh, so today we're gonna share some of the recommendations that were made for faculty members. Uh, I, I'm a little hesitant to use the word recommendations because as you'll hear, community campus engagement is, is about practice. It's about theory and practice and how they inform each other. And it's so context specific that, you know, having detailed recommendations that you follow the letter is, is kind of missing the point because so much of this is about relationships and about relationship building and trust and, and how to work in that situation as you'll hear today. Uh, so uh, we'll start with, we have short presentations from uh, all four of us will speak for about five minutes uh, around specific questions that we plan this webinar around, and then we'll invite discussion and questions from our audience, both in the room and joining us online. And so I'll ask Charles <coughs> to speak first. And uh, he was asked to speak to the question, how can faculty assist in the development of equitable community campus engagement principles and practices? Charles Lepka. Thanks. Uh, so um, in, in addressing the ways that faculty can assist in the development of equitable pra principles, uh, practices and principles, I want to speak briefly to, to some of the recommendations that, that came out of Suffice, as, as, as you mentioned, um, and, and really kind of from two, two sides, both from inside the academy and also from working with community partners in community. And I think that both these areas are, are really important to consider in relation to each other because faculty often play an important brokering role and when taking a community first approach uh, can have significant leverage and influence both in the community and also within their post-secondary institutions. So let me start by talking about recommendations inside the academy. So first, community campus engagement is not something that can be done in isolation. And it's important that faculty make space for it in their, in their teaching, uh, learning, uh, and implement, and really to, in all the ways that, to implement equitable community campus engagement uh, principles and practices throughout those different aspects of their work. So this includes building mutually beneficial and uh, reciprocal relationships and moving from rhetoric to action. It takes an, a realignment of resources, of time, and of commitment uh, and focus. And it also includes bridging key issues of social justice, of equity, into teaching and research and all aspects of their work. For example, it means working with and supporting uh, community partners and at times welcoming a certain level of discomfort. So I attempted to do some of this through uh, a graduate community service learning class that I taught at the university, I co-taught at the University of Toronto. Um, through this class, we incorporated a range of material on community campus engagement, equity, and, and critical theory right into the syllabus. So had students actually reading uh, some, of that, some of that theory. Uh, working with, uh, we worked specifically with social justice focused groups, uh, and these were organizations in the community that were specifically working on, uh, you know, issues of, of social justice or, ec or ecological justice within the community. Um, we also provided a space for community partners to co-develop the course on an ongoing level with us. So that would have been coming into the classroom. It also meant sometimes recommending readings or directions for the course. And it also meant producing outcomes from the, the, this, this community engaged research um, that were co-developed with community partners to really ensure that these, these outputs were of benefit to them as well as they were to the students and to the faculty. So that really leads me to the second area I want to focus on, um, which is ways that faculty can assist the development of equitable community campus engagement principles and practices uh, working with community partners in community. 
So first off, learning from uh, our work with Suffice, we, we found that it's really vital to work together to clarify the roles and expectations, as well as to identify limits to the kinds of engagements we can have. So this means that at one, at one level, uh, both being visionary, but also being very realistic about what can be achieved. Um, faculty need to have hard conversations about partners' needs and issues, um, as well as ownership and control of community knowledge. Um, and those conversations need to happen early on and continue to happen throughout the phase of the project. It also means recognizing uh, the value of place-based and experiential knowledge, as well as opportunities to co-create knowledge as the project uh, moves forward. And ideally, this would come with compensation, and that could be financial, but it doesn't have to be. There could be other kinds of compensation uh, for community as well. And most important, I think it means uh, engaging with respectful and strategic uh, partners, uh, respectful and st strategically with uh, partners in the community. So recognizing that community campus engagement takes uh, significant resources and time, and you know, provide, making sure you have the time to, to engage in those, in those activities, but also when it's done well, that it can be extremely mutually beneficial. So this was evident in, in one of our phase one projects uh, um, we worked on. The project was called Responsibility and Relationships, Decolonizing the British Columbia Food Systems Network. And with this project, we worked very closely with a, a provincial network organization uh, working on food systems uh, in, in British Columbia. Uh, so in 2015, the project really tried to explore what it was, what it meant to, to really decolonize praxis through day-to-day -day activities um, and conversations with staff and, and network members. So the goal of the project was to understand um, what, what, what were the most appropriate relationships that could, that could be developed between a largely settler network uh, and the Working Group on Indigenous Food Sovereignty, uh, which is located in British Columbia, but is pan-Canadian. Uh, and, and this group really carries the voice and the vision in many ways of the Indigenous hunting, fishing, farming, uh, and gathering communities who have persisted throughout the history, the very dirty history of colonization. Um, and the project really made space to critically reflect on the language, the relationships, and the practices that could contribute to the building and a more respectful and effective community campus relationship between uh, academia and, and indigenous communities. So the work really involved a whole range of very, very uh, difficult conversations right from the outset and throughout the project and, and about, about the real and perceived needs and opportunities uh, that the project presented. So from this project, we, we created a, we had a, we produced a report uh, for Suffice, which really summarized the activities and some of the key learnings. Uh, there was a really beautiful podcast that was uh, created by some of the project members um, that was really geared towards folks uh, working with Indigenous communities, uh, specifically on Indigenous settler relations and food systems. Um, we, we identified a very deep learning from all the participants that were involved. Um, for example, one of the participants um, who was a staff with the BC Food Systems Network uh, produced a decolonizing pledge, which really intended to suggest activities that would enable settlers to demonstrate a commitment to decolonizing uh, their own minds and lives and to take responsibility uh, for educating ourselves. And finally, um, it was this, this was really part of an evolving relationship with the food movement across the country. And the BC Food Systems Network has really become uh, a model for, for what, other, what other groups can do. Well, uh, we're gonna start to have a discussion after the, each of the four little presentations. So I'll pass it straight on to uh, Dr. Nadine Chankfoot, who is going to speak to the question of how can faculty support students in developing long-term CCE relationships and projects? Thanks, Peter. Uh, so for me, I'll start out by saying it relates to equity um, in what Charles was um, sharing uh, in, in terms of reciprocity. So for me, good community campus partnerships require reciprocity. By reciprocity, I mean working to ensure that all participants benefit from the partnership. And this, importantly, includes our students. So to support students in a reciprocal partnership, this means building a trusting, transparent relationship with them. So I am um, I noticed that I've, I'm developing about seven or, seven or eight working practice as follows. I know these aren't the only ones, but I'll start out with these. So first, I feel it's really important to recognize students as knowledge holders. Many of our students come with uh, enormous um, activism experience and experience working with community organizations. 
and in, I, I encourage them, invite them to share their vision uh, with the project as um, they develop with it. Um, I think it's important for me to share the culture of our project partners because uh, they're stepping in often midstream and so there's a history uh, that I think is beneficial for them to be brought into. And that includes outlining the sensitivities. So relationship building um, has many, has, is a journey and so there's tensions, um, disagreements, um, including conflicts that I think uh, it's important for students to be knowledgeable of. Uh, building trust is really important to encourage, encourage students to share openly uh, their own experiences and challenges and their own interpretations, uh, both of myself um, and the relationships as they develop and observe them. Um, all the while bringing them into also ethical, the ethics um, and principles of BCE. Uh, another way, another working practice um, I, um, I use or develop with students is um, sharing uh, when I don't know something and encouraging them to develop the skill to say, I don't know, I don't understand, I don't know how this is going to work. Uh, another working practice is to encourage students to envision potential possibilities and continuation of CCE. Um, and then lastly, offer mentoring and timely advances for travel um, and expense reimbursement. So I don't want students to be out of pocket um, wherever possible. Uh, so I want to share a story um, with a relationship I've had with PhD student at Trent University, Helen Nib, and she and I worked together on the evaluation of phase one in uh, the Peterborough Halliburton region, working with our community partners. So uh, right from the get-go, we had weekly meetings uh, about four months before the data collection and throughout the project. Uh, and during these meetings, I benefited enormously from Helen's own experience uh, in curriculum development, in evaluation experience she had through Fleming College with the museum's project there, as well as with the United Nations, uh, and more. And she also, um, Helen also shared that uh, through the project, through our meetings, and through really frank and open discussion around the sensitivities, around um, uncertainty, how the evaluation went, uh, would unfold, uh, she said she really came to belong and feel very valued in the research and in the community. And uh, this was very important because at the time she was doing her coursework, the PhD coursework for the first year, and she shared that it isn't the most grounded experience taking coursework because it sometimes feels separated from concrete experiences. So being immersed in evaluation phase, speaking with community partners, um, and uh, finding out community partners' experiences with the FICE project was very grounding at a time, at that time. Um, as well, she was preparing for her comp, so in a way that our working together provided a space for some mentoring around that as well. So uh, we discussed longer term possibilities for presentations and scholarly outputs. And while Helen was enthusiastic for this, uh, she decided that uh, she really needed to focus on her own research and other professional projects, which, which took her to China, and she also has a passion for sheep and wool. So sometimes, um, sometimes continuation of CCE beyond a specific project doesn't happen. Um, nonetheless, it can feel really good to end a project on a really high note. So uh, as well, Helen still continues within CCE, so she did share that Suffice uh, gave her the skills, gave her experience within a CCE project that she is now taking into another project on sheep and wool, the Ontario wool um, study. Uh, so she took a step sideways um, and is still in CCE. So I'll stop there. Great, thanks, thanks. Nadine. Uh, what I <clears throat> and to give, to give you all some context, I really appreciate that both you and Charles gave very personal stories that helped to explain these broader uh, bits of guidance and working practices, recommendations that came out of our symposium last January. So these were 
sort of broad observations made by the group mix between academics and community partners, and you've each sort of really personalized in terms of showing how uh, it relates to your own practices and your own relationships. Uh, I'm going to speak to uh, a few other recommendations that were made at the symposium around how faculty can help to institutionalize community-driven community campus engagement projects. And uh, I'm just going to speak to first four points here. First, the recommendation was put forward at the symposium that faculty who are serious about this work, as we are here, uh, have a responsibility, really, to encourage their institutions to become more community responsive. Uh, and this can be, uh, it can be a challenge. Often our institutions have many other responsibilities, and so getting them to focus on how are you engaging this community and are you doing it as, as effectively and well as you can and as respectfully as you can can be a challenge. Uh, and one of the observations that was made that a, a key area of culture change necessary within post-secondary institutions, particularly universities, are the tenure and promotion systems. These are the ways, these are the systems that incentivize faculty by saying, you know, you have to get so many publications here, you have to do so much of this kind of work in order to be granted uh, your status as an associate prof and as a full prof in our institution. And so um, I'll start with that by just by saying, yes, we do need to take seriously that tenure and promotion standards uh, need to better consider the types of outputs that come from community campus engagement projects. And uh, quite honestly, I, how I've come to see this is it's really about educating our colleagues. Because those who adjudicate on tenure and promotion committees are our colleagues within our departments and within the university. And uh, frankly, there are many ways to be a good scholar. There are the, the, the pure science scholars, and then there's a whole uh, a continuum. And community-engaged scholarship is one of the valid ways to be a scholar. Um, but the, frankly, it often takes more time to lead to outputs uh, because it takes time to build relationships with a partner, to define the projects that we're going to work on together, to work on that over time, to get some results that are useful for the community partner, and then at the same time to turn that into uh, a research article or something that, that contributes to scholarship. It can often be a long process. Um, but when that process is explained to many of our colleagues and they understand why it has taken time or why a publication is coming out, it's come out from 10 authors rather than one, um, they can often see the point and the value and the fact that, that uh, when you work directly with partners, the knowledge mobilization happens through the process. It doesn't just happen at the end as it may with more traditional scholarly outputs. So I think part of it is uh, about on the responsibility to our partners to actually make that case within our, in, within, within our own institutions. Um, at the same time, I just want to pass on the anecdote that I got from a, a senior community-engaged scholar who has since retired and she encouraged me not to put all my eggs in the basket pre-tenure of community-based research because she says it does take time and make sure you've also got some of those single authored, you know, traditional journal articles uh, to show, to test your mettle on that side as well because some of your colleagues will be looking for that. So, you know, it's, it's important that we, I don't want to give the wrong advice here, so that, that's part of the advice as well. A uh, second point that I want to make is around uh, encouraging faculty members who are committed to equitable community campus engagement to uh, work within their institutions to build a community of practice where other faculty members who are doing this work can share with each other and we can raise the profile of this work within our institutions. And within Carleton, I've, uh, for the last number of years, I've uh, chaired what is called the Carleton Committee on Community Engaged Pedagogy. And it is just that, it's a group of faculty members uh, and some community partners, and at times we've had graduate students and we've had professional services staff who all see the value of community-engaged learning as part of our mandate as a, as a teaching university. And uh, <clears throat> we organize uh, regular training events for faculty members. We've organized an annual community engagement event that profiles the, the, our student projects and our faculty projects. And uh, collectively, I think we're really raising the profile within this institution, and thus, you know, that even spills over to affect the tenure and promotion processes. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, I'll just point out that in 2011, that committee, our university doesn't track the number of students who are inv involved in community engagement projects. And so that committee, off the sides of our desk, we decided to call all the units on campus, and we learned that there were about 2,500 student opportunities per year 
going out into the community. Um, and uh, just getting those numbers raised the profile within the university of, okay, this is really a teaching practice that matters and the university has to support it. Third point I want to make is, uh, and it, I think it was touched on earlier by Charles, is including when we have community partners as partners in research projects that we inc make sure that we uh, include a, a con community contribution in the research grant funding. Because frankly, these projects often are way more administratively onerous than we might think off the beginning. And I see some people nodding their heads in this room. Uh, but the research ethics process, for example, is not something community partners are necessarily used to. And yet, once you get involved in it, it can delay a project by months. It can take a lot of reading over research interview questions. Are we doing methodological questions that have to be worked out with the partner? That all takes time, and it can be taking way more time than was anticipated off the front end. And so as faculty members, when we're applying for research funds, it's legitimate to ask for some funds to offset that kind of a time contribution that community partners are going to make into the project. Uh, the last thing I want to say is, uh, and this again was a recommendation that came out of the symposium, that faculty need to reflexively address issues of power in community campus engagement at the intersection of class, race, gender, and colonialism. And uh, the story that I'll relate around this is something, an issue that recently uh, came home to me here in Carleton. Uh, while I've been involved in promoting community campus engagement across the university for a number of years, um, we've never in directly had indigenous faculty involved in our community engaged pedagogy committee. We've had many faculty who work with indigenous communities, but we haven't had the indigenous faculty members from Carleton involved in our committee. Um, and so the annual conferences, we didn't necessarily feature the projects being done with indigenous communities. Um, and I had honestly just assumed that indigenous faculty maybe weren't interested or had their own avenues for sharing the kind of work that they're doing. And I, I think to a certain extent they do. Uh, but uh, recently we were trying to organize an event that kind of got derailed a bit because we did not have strong enough indigenous participation, both from the indigenous community and indigenous faculty. And and I realize that I have, if I'm going to, you know, walk the talk that we're talking about today, then I need to reach out. And in fact, just have in the last little while reached out to Indigenous uh, faculty members on campus to say, hey, how can we make sure that the Committee on Community Engaged Pedagogy is, is speaking to the kinds of projects and work that you're doing as well as we are. So that's the, anyways, that's my anecdote around trying to be reflexive about power relations in the kind of work that we do. So to sum up, these four examples are meant to show how we as faculty members can start affecting the cultures within our own institutions and then bring more attention and validity to community campus engagement practices that are respectful of community partners, their needs, and their priorities. I hope these examples also show how we need to be self-reflexive as practitioners, second-guessing our own assumptions sometimes and motivations in this work so we, we can be more inclusive and more effective. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Colleen Christopherson Cote to give us some feedback from the community perspective, who you've been involved in many projects with your local institution and now at a national level with Suffice. And I just wonder what, uh, what you're hearing. Right. Thanks, Peter. Um, and I also want to thank the faculty and academy for allowing the sort of community voice to be here. I mean, this is a community first project, right? And so it's interesting for me to sort of listen and reflect and and think about how this work intersects at a community level, local level, but also how it sort of filters through um, to higher level policy. Um, and so recently, so in the first part of the Suffice Project, um, Saskatoon was involved in looking at the role that co-location and the university's role in co-location plays on reducing poverty. So that that's the local context that I want to talk about. Um, but when I listen to all three of the um, stories and, and backgrounds and, and experiences and recommendations, um, I'm struck by the findings that we sort of came to the conclusion around were there's three main elements in all of that work and it's about people, it's about place, and it's about passion. And so those three pieces fall into place in all the work that we do and I hear it in the reflection in all the stories even at the faculty level. Um, community and faculty or community in the academy speak different languages, but we actually are talking about the same things. And so when I talk about people, I'm talking about long-term relationships, things that take a long, uh, a lot of energy and time and commitment and trust and reciprocity built into uh, building those relationships to move work forward. 
Um, I know that reconciliation for me is a critical element to the work that I do. So the idea of decolonizing evaluation frameworks is on my agenda. I don't talk like that in the community, but when I'm sort of bridging the gap into the academic world, then we can have those conversations around sort of what does the evaluation framework really look like at the community level? How do I break that down? Um, how do I look at it through a lens of, of reconciliation and do justice to things like the TRC calls to action, UNDRIP, um, and, and the recognition of treaty within my, within my territory and within my province and then across Canada as well. Um, the idea of passion, I think everyone, regardless of you're in, in the trenches doing community work all the way up to sort of a higher level academic uh, level, people come with that passion. And so how do you tap into that passion? Um, how do you ensure that students are placed with their passions in community so that the work that they're doing um, is tied to where they want to go and, and they're not being catapulted into uh, an environment where they're not ready or don't want to be there um, just for the sake of, of sort of an academic perspective. Um, and then the other thing around place, and so we do a lot of work in Saskatoon around place-based learning. Um, Station 20 West is where the bulk of the research was for the first part of Suffice um, and around why we have a campus engagement office situated within our core neighborhood, what is its role um, to broker and to facilitate relationships among core neighborhood people, but also um, faculty, community-driven research, uh, and then community-based organizations, and what does all that intersection, ha what happens with all that intersection. And so um, for me, it was really sort of reinforcing the idea that I think we're all talking about those three things, right? The, the critical nature of having the right people in the right place who have the right passions all coming together to come and, and drive that change. And ultimately, I mean, ultimately for me, it's about policy change. And so how do we then use all of the work that's happening at a community level um, tied to the research piece to, to make change at a policy level so that um, people in the fields that we're working in um, actually get what they need. Thank you, Colleen. Um, so what we're going to do right now is we did ask those who registered for the webinar in advance to send any questions that they would had hoped to hear answered. So I'm going to uh, raise some of those questions right now. We'll start with some of those and then we'll go uh, if there's questions and comments in the room or uh, to any questions that are coming up online. So this is a chance for anybody who's been listening in to maybe t type your questions in that, you're, that are coming forward for you. And I'm going to start with a question that was raised by uh, Ashley McInnes. Uh, she said, as a PhD student and emerging academic, I'm hesitant to approach organizations for research collaboration. I've worked in community campus engagement partnerships for over 10 years as a team member. But I still feel that without an established track record, record and reputation as a principal investigator, I don't have the clout of an established academic. Do you have suggestions for how to approach an organization about publishing a research pro project? Uh, and the next question came from Victoria Ho, uh, who asked the question, what's, what's your process for determining the organizations and community groups you choose for CCE partnerships? So I'm going to take those two together and see if uh, Charles wants to speak to Ashley and Victoria's question. Hmm. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a good question. It's a great question. I mean, I have very recently moved from being a PhD student to a faculty. Uh, so I've kind of been on both ends of, and I, of, of this, and I can, I, you know, I can relate to the question. And I think that um, there's, you know, just to preface this by saying there is no simple answer to this and there's no silver bullet. I think to anything we're talking about here, so much of this is, as Peter said, context specific. And it's about, it's really about, you know, the, the individual and communal relationships that are built, right? So just a few quick points to both of these questions. One is, I think, you know, and I think we all kind of spoke to this, is about, it's about relationships. You know, it's about taking time to really build those relationships. And relationships can't be built over email and can't necessarily be built over telephone, but it's a lot of face-to-face -face time. It's a lot of, you know, making that space early on, even before, well before the research starts, and to keep that moving on, moving forward. And then to having, again, as I mentioned in my, in my presentation, these difficult conversations early on. You know, you can't expect to, you know, have, a, have one kind of relationship and then, you know, a year or two later, say, oh, now I'm going to write about this, and then, then saying, wait a second, you know, you never, we didn't know that. I mean, that's where I think the challenges start. So I think if you're coming in as a student, being honest and being clear about your needs, you know, I'm here because I have to write something about this, or this is my job, I need to write uh, an article about this. Um, and, and, and having that negotiation early on is, 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 is important. And, you know, my experience has been that community groups, 
are open to that. They understand that. They have needs too. And you know, when, when by, by kind of having that conversation, there's, it's, it's, it's possible to kind of meet those mutually, meet those needs mutually or, or mutual bene mutually be mutually beneficial. Um, and I think there's also a need to be flexible as you move through that and not say, well, these are my needs and I, I, I have no flexibility there. Because if that's what you're doing, you might as well go write a single authored, you know, publication and not try to do it with other people. Because if you're working with someone, you have to be willing to negotiate as you move along and to change sometimes. So I think that's, that's, that's one key thing. Um, another, another issue, and speaking a bit to more of Victoria's question is, you know, how do we, how do we build these partnerships? Who do we build them with? It's about, for me, it's always been about working with groups that I already have connection with or I have some mutual connection with. I have a passion towards the kind of work they're doing. They believe in the work I'm doing. Um, and, and when we start from a, a place of common, a common interest, a common goal, um, you know, it, it becomes a lot, not just easier, but more enjoyable to work together. And again, it comes back to this point that we've all been making about the, the relationship, those mutual relationships. Um, and even if you don't have that relationship right away, you know, you can go through your supervisor, go through an organization you've been volunteering with. There's lots of ways you can start, I think, by connecting with your existing uh, relationships. And the last thing I want to, I want to say is. Um, it's important right from the beginning to, to not just think about all the great things that are going to happen, but also recognize the limitations at the, at right from the start and to try to be proactive about addressing those, right? So issues of who owns knowledge, who's going who's gonna to write the article. You know, if, if, you know, if I'm working with communities, I'm often committed to when I write about that is to write with them. I might take the lead and do 90% of the work, but I make sure they have a say, they can edit, they can you know, write or not write as, as they need to, and their name goes on that article, which also gives them legitimacy for the work they're doing. So again, that can be an uncomfortable process, but I think, again, doing it early, um, making space for those conversations, you know, again, not just the positive, but also the challenges right from the beginning is, is an important place to start. Great, thank you, Carly. Uh, the next question, we're, we'll do one more of these, and then we'll go now to see if there's any uh, questions coming off the, uh, the webinar. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Jackson wrote, I'm new to my role at, uh, at Guelph Community Engagement Scholarship Institute and working to develop strategies to contribute to the university's indigenization strategy. I'd love to hear about projects and practices that have worked in deep collaboration and in a learning spirit towards shared goals in that regard. More generally, I'm interested in integrating arts-based community making into CES practice, where I work, social science based, without losing the core principles and commitments that have made that make arts-based research effective and distinctive. So that's quite a lot going on in that question. But I'll ask Nadine maybe to speak to some of uh, Elizabeth's questions. Yeah, thanks, Peter. I would love to um, give a preliminary answer. So Elizabeth, I think it's fantastic that you're working to integrate arts-based research and CES. Uh, I can share my own experience where I've practiced arts-based research um, in partnership with community. Again, reciprocity is very key. So I worked with the YWCA in the Peterborough, Halliburton, Victoria region um, to create multimedia digital stories uh, directed by women living with disabilities through uh, mobilizing the meaning of disability and difference project. Uh, for the YWCA, it was really clear, um, important to be clear of, on the benefits that, the, that would accrue to the YWCA. And this included recognition of the YWCA in all the videos, uh, adequate professional fees for YWCA, YWCA staff time uh, for their role and for the space, um, and being clear who can use uh, the videos created and for what purpose. So research ethics and consent um, is very important to consider uh, deliberatively for the community partner, for the directors of the videos, and for uh, the university. So uh, I think that's a start and I can connect you with an Indigenous professor and a non-Indigenous professor engaged in arts-based research with Inuit and Indigenous peoples in the GTA, Ottawa and the North. Great. And Elizabeth should maybe find, find your email at the politics uh, side at uh, Trent and then she can uh, yeah. connect with you. Sure, we'll get in touch. All uh, right, Nicole, are there any questions coming from our online community? No, okay. Well, then I will move to, well, actually, are there any questions coming up from the floor here or comments that uh, individuals want to make? We have a, 
a mix of uh, both community partner organizations and faculty members in the room here from Carleton and Trent University and from Alberta and BC. So uh, I actually would like to, oh, yes, Aji, can you give the, uh, the, I actually would like to, oh, yes, Aji, can you give the, uh, the uh, microphone to Professor Aji van de Sand from the School of Social Work here at Carleton University. And do you want to face the, 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 the camera when you're giving your question, even if you're asking it? Okay, one of the issues that uh, I encountered is recently one of the projects that we're doing right now through our research center. Uh, is the challenge of getting our project accepted by the research funding officials of the university. I think there's still kind of this feeling uh, in the university that these the faculty that are in charge of these projects and therefore, you know, it's the faculty member that has to be held accountable for the expectations of the research protocol. With community-based participatory research, uh, we're trying to share responsibility and control. And so if the community is going to be in charge of the project, then I think the Research Ethics Board needs to understand that there's a different uh, way of dealing with protocols. Because one of the things about community-based research is the project can change many times. And every time it changes, then you have to go back to the Research Ethics Board put in a change of protocol, and make sure that that gets approved before you can implement uh, the changes. And the other thing, too, is uh, some of the projects that communities are interested in, like if, for instance, you're trying to do a pilot project, uh, the evaluation of a new program, uh, and they're trying to have a comparison group, the Research Ethics Board may insist that uh, you can't deny people that are in the comparison group uh, to be able to participate in a program that was specifically designed to meet their needs. Uh, and so we have to show, yeah, well, you know, that may be true, but we don't know if a new program is effective. So therefore, our argument is that we are not necessarily depriving people of a program that is clearly meant to meet their needs until we can demonstrate that it is effective. Right. So there's a number of ethical challenges related to community-based research. And uh, I think it requires sort of a different attitude, a different mindset on the part of universities that clearly recognize the importance of putting communities first. Thank you for... Well, I'm, I'm sorry, because Adji kind of answered his question as he was, was asking it, so I'm not going to fully repeat it, other than he was pointing out that there are a number of challenges with the research ethics process where research ethics boards don't quite uh, acknowledge the, um, the fact that these applications that they see might have been co-developed by community partners with faculty members and they often just expect that they can come back to the faculty member and say make this and this change and that you can just do that. But it's a negotiation process for you to go back to the community partners and talk that over. I mean, Part of the challenge is here is that technically the inst our institutions are on the hook with our funders, the federal government and provincial governments to follow these uh, research ethics protocols. And that's why the research ethics boards have been established. Um, the, the only thing that I'll say to this, and, and Adji, in fact, because you're here at Carleton, I, I almost think you were part of this conversation probably about six years ago, the engaged pedagogy group that I chair had a meeting with members of the research ethics board at the time because to, to talk through, do they understand community-based research and how flexible are they willing to be? And uh, that conversation was very useful at the time because frankly, they had a lot of members who did not have that methodological training and didn't have that background. And I seem to recall shortly after that meeting, you, were you recruited onto the Research Ethics Board? Yes, so you sat there for about three years, uh, which was, because it was important for them to have people on that committee who can explain this methodology and the, the, the uniqueness of it. Um, and I think probably what's happened is you've probably stepped up, moved on, and now there are new people on that committee, and so that education process happens, has to happen again. I mean, this is part of our role as faculty members who uh, appreciate the intricacies of this wor work to be communicating it with our colleagues. Um, the, the other thing that I would say, this is a micro version of what we're talking about, 
is when I've had challenges with my research ethics board, as soon as there's been about two emails that go back and forth and they say they want to do this and I say I want to do this and they say they want to do that, then I write them back and I say, can I come and have a meeting with you and my student or and my partner or whatever? Uh, and there is a chair of the board, set up a meeting with the chair of that particular committee and talk it over because a lot of things can get sorted out there. Otherwise, the email ping pong goes on and, and you're rewriting, you, you keep rewriting the application thinking that you're addressing what they wanted, but they wanted something else. So I've learned having the conversation in person. I need to add something, because uh, another piece of uh, what you said, Adji, um, was, was also about ethics from a community level as well. And, you know, often the way research ethics boards work is they're, you know, managed by the university, they're decided by academics, and I think there's another question that you raise in there which we need to think about when we talk about community first and ethics, we need to think about, well, what, what are the, what are the, what does ethics mean from a community perspective? And how does, how do community get to speak for themselves as opposed to ac the academics deciding what's ethical for community groups? And um, one of the, just to give a quick example, one of the things that we worked on uh, with our, one of our community partners from phase, phase one and phase two of Suffice, uh, Community Food, Secu uh, Food Secure Canada, um, was a, a, a protocol essentially for um, academics that want to work with the organization. And it's not, you know, it's not a finite document, but it was a set of kind of ideals and principles that they kind of said to, to academics, if you want to do research with us, these are the kinds of things you need to think about. And it's on their website and it's, you know, something that uh, hopefully will be evolving as we move forward in our relationship. But essentially it gives the, uh, the organization an opportunity to say, these are the kinds of principles and practices and ethics that we adhere to and we need you to understand before you work with us. Yeah, re the research ethics process, as uh, G knows and many others here know, but I, it's important to clarify, was meant to protect individual subjects of an academic's research project, to make sure that those subjects wouldn't come to harm with if they're sharing information that then gets shared on through the research project and that could somehow implicate them in, in and put them in a difficult situation. And so it does not deal, for example, with community interests. It deals with individual interests. So, uh, for example, in work with indigenous communities, uh, there is now the, the OCAP principles, ownership, control, access, and I forget what the P stands for. Protection. Protection. Possession. Possession of the data of research projects. And so there are new principles that are emerging that are very much more from the community perspective about these are the, the, the ethical principles that we want to see protected in, in an engagement process with, uh, with the outside, with academics and others. Experience with yes, ethics. please. Yeah. So my first ever experience with community with academic ethics uh, in Suffice was a bit of a disaster from a community perspective. So two universities, two sets of ethic boards, like uh, months and months of delays to try and get information done that was eventually fine. Um, but there was an underlying assumption, I think, throughout the process from both um, academic institutions that the community doesn't have its own set of ethics approvals or ethics protocol. And we actually do. Um, and so like Poverty Reduction Partnership in Saskatoon has a very uh, rigid inclusionary guidelines around how we access people with lived experience of poverty, what that looks like, how we resource it. Um, and we govern that ourselves. While it's not rigorous and academic in the sense of your ethics board, it still meets those, those protectionary pieces around the people that were that we have as colleagues. And so there was this sort of breakdown in communication and this assumption that what we were doing as a, a practice in community wasn't quite good enough or there was an undervalue to the way that we managed our own ethical processes. And so it kind of speaks again to that idea of, of understanding each other's language and, and what we're trying to do and, and coming meeting people in, in sort of a midway point. Yeah, in Canada, we haven't yet really had the conversation about how ethics processes and protocols and the standards need to be revisited from a community perspective, other than through the SHRC Social Science and Humanities Research Council principles around research with Indigenous people. That's the only area where we've come close, and even then there's some debate about that, but we haven't taken the, that same conversation and principles at the national level to thinking about uh, community-based research more broadly. Uh, I get a sense that Steve Hill, Professor Steve Hill from Trent, has a question over here. So 
pass the microphone to him. I'll look at you. I'll look at the camera. Uh, uh, yes, uh, it's Steve Hill from Trent. I, I wondered about, you, you talked about the, the principles for equity um, for students to have a, in, in guiding them, Nadine, in, in their relationship and talked about a, a senior PhD student. And I wondered if you might also um, contrast that with someone uh, starting out, uh, maybe a, even at an undergraduate um, experience of, you know, a capstone course or honors thesis or third year course-based project, any kind of advice or thoughts? And I'd, I'd open it up to everyone else that might have thoughts or experience, you know, or even working with students that uh, we are building capacity, so we don't always have. You, you prefaced your question with a lot of times students do bring a lot, and they do. They bring their own lived experience, their own backgrounds, uh, tremendous assets, but but they're also learning, and we're helping them in that journey. So um, when they don't know much, what, what can we do or do you have ideas? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll start us off. I think that is a great question. I am working with an undergraduate student at Trent uh, who brings with her a lot of activist experience um, and experience working with community organizations. And at the same time, what um, we have been discovering is that it would be very helpful, and I think I'm realizing that maybe there's already something that's been developed at this device, um, a, um, how would you say it, not a, a guide, a guide of principles, but also I think communication. I noticed that one thing, um, for example, I was bringing her, bringing her into what I consider professional communication um, within the university and the community as I've experienced. So again, it's my own working practice and experience. And at first she was, at first there was like question mark, really? Or like, and, and then we, Got on, and then I was thinking about it, and I thought, looking over my communication practices with colleagues and other, um, let's say, graduate students who have um, been involved in community-based research as undergraduates, that this was more or less a standard. And so I thought, yeah, I wonder if this is written down anywhere. <laughs> and so maybe that's just one specific example where some guidelines. So we are going to be creating some guidelines um, just through our own working practices as, the, as they have evolved through our own working together over the last few years. Is that? The other yeah. thing that I'd just like to say something to this is uh, what I've found when working with undergraduate students in course-based contexts in particular is having a clear agreement off the front end between the professor, the community organization, and the students that they all sign on to about what is expected when, what are the communications protocols, when can, can each uh, participant expect to be providing feedback on a draft of something and then getting feedback from that, um, uh, spelling out, yeah, w whether you're going to be doing phone calls or emails and what the, you know, maybe not into the details of what it looks like and, and what, how much short form you're using, but those kind of um, <clears throat> getting consensus among the three parties early on is really important. And I know you know, you, you two both work at the Trent Community Research Center, and in fact, it's their draft agreement that I've modified and have used in my practice because we don't have a standard form at Carleton uh, for that. The, the other thing that I would say that's really important here is if you're the professor of a course that has a number of students working out in the community, be really careful how many relationships you bring into that course. So the first time I taught a community service learning course, I had, I think, 34 students working with 18 different partners. And uh, it, it was absurd. I didn't know that it was absurd, but it was absurd in the sense that those were 18 relationships that I hoped to have back again the next year, right? So I needed to make sure that these 34 students were not burning 18 bridges. And uh, it, it was reasonably successful, but the next time that I ran that course, they were all in groups of three and four students, and I met, you know, I got it down to maybe eight relationships or something like that. And that was more manageable, and I've even since then have worked with large groups of students on one or two projects in a class, with one or two external partners. Each of the students can be doing some piece of it, and then it, I, as the prof, make sure that ch regularly check in with the external partner. So anyways, that was that's kind of been my learning about, uh, about scale. Uh, Nicole has a question from online, and then I think we're, we only have a couple of minutes left in the webinar, so we're going to have to close it off soon.
So this is mostly just a comment from Janet. Uh, she said she would like to add to the conversation that from her experience in teaching a CEL course, it's important to really consider the content process ratio. CEL yes. work takes a lot of support and the CEL process is where the learning is really rich and each relationship is unique. Yeah, I very much agree. When I first started teaching courses with a community engagement component, I thought I would still cover all the same content and then have these additional projects. And I, re you know, I realized I had to cut about 50% of my content out uh, and to the benefit of the course because we spent way more time debriefing the engagement experiences and it was a much richer course for the students. So it's, it wasn't a detriment to the course, but it just meant it was a different kind of course. Um, I feel like we've, uh, Nicole, how much time do you have uh, left? Five minutes including the survey or separate? Okay, so uh, there were two other points that came up from the questions in advance that I just want to raise. Uh, well, one was Crystal Tremblay asked the question of Im about impact. What are the different frameworks that have been developed to measure impact of engaged research and learning? Uh, and frankly, I, in this five minutes that we have left, we're not going to get into this, but I just want to let you know, Crystal, that we've taken note of this and uh, I'm going to propose that we'll run a webinar because we know people across Canada and internationally who are really working on this question uh, you know, at, a, at an institution-wide level and beyond. And so I think we will revisit this question in a, in a future webinar. Um, and there was really one other set of questions from Rita Hansen-Stern. And so maybe I'll ask any of you who want to contribute to this. What are the best strategies in your experience to save time and energy in a collaborative project? and to reduce bias or assumptions when collaborating. Um, or you can ask, answer the question, uh, what is, what's a key piece of knowledge you wish you had possessed when you started, when you started collaborating with community organizations? So either to save time and energy, to reduce bias and assumptions, or something that you wish you knew off the beginning. And I'll give each of our presenters a chance to make some closing remarks. It sounds like you are, Colleen. Um, okay, I'll reflect actually on the assumptions and the idea of collaboration. Early, one of the earlier questions asked about deep collaboration, particularly with Indigenous people. Um, and I know, and this I guess is also a lesson that I learned that I wish I had known um, in the beginning part of my path of reconciliation, was that it's not necessarily Indigenous partners' responsibility to catch you up to speed. Um, that as a community researcher and as a community partner, it is your sort of fiduciary obligation, particularly if you're a colonizer or from a settler perspective, um, to learn the history, to familiarize yourself with the territory, uh, and to learn that yourself. Um, I think historically, uh, even myself, I'm guilty of making, building a relationship with an Indigenous partner and then asking them to teach me. Uh, and I don't think that that's um, really deep collaborative work. I think it is my responsibility to learn that on my own and to use that relationship to, to reframe my truth. Uh, Charles and Nadine, do you have a, a minute each to respond to any of the later questions? Um, I can, I'll go next. I think for me, saving time and energy really comes back to building relationship uh, at, the, at the outset and perhaps giving more time uh, at the beginning to get to know one another, one another's needs in terms of resources, perhaps especially in terms of recognition uh, within one each um, partner's context, for example. And I think attunement, attuning to capacities, and I was thinking of Steve's uh, question uh, to me, and capacities um, really vary. And also, uh, my experience with collaborating with community uh, to be open to change. Change occurs, and often quickly. Yes. Yeah, so I think what I say, I'll just be quick because it's a bit, a bit of echoing what's already been said. I think one is doing, I agree, doing the background work when you work with a community, just to echo Colleen a little bit. Um, you know, it's not the community's responsibility to catch us up on, on, on all that needs to be known. And I think that's part of our responsibility when we're working with, whether it's Indigenous communities or non-Indigenous settler communities, I think we need to really do that work to understand the context in which we're getting into. 
Um, and then in terms of time and energy and, and saving, I, I don't know, I, maybe to partially to echo what you just said, Nadine, but maybe to kind of turn that around, I think we maybe need to put more time and more energy into that work and not always trying to be reduced that and be more efficient because um, long-term partnerships, you know, real, real deep engagement uh, does take a lot of that time. And I think sometimes I've found that I actually end up doing more than I ever expected because I'm trying to reduce administrative burdens on the community partners I work with. Uh, if they don't understand how the academy works, whether it's ethics or other things, you know, it means, you know, really having a lot of conversations and supporting that uh, relationship to kind of walk through how that some of that works. And, and vice versa, when I don't understand things and the community, communities need to do that to me. So, you know, even coming here, you know, I'm from Thunder Bay and coming all the way down here to be part of this webinar, to, to meet with my colleagues. I mean, that takes time and it takes energy. And I think if we're doing community work, as maybe where Peter, you talked about this as well, especially as students, we need to be aware of the of time and energy that that takes and we should be prepared to, to make that effort. Being aware of time and energy, uh, but I also I do want to agree with Nadine that clarifying off the beginning what you can offer and what you can't and getting clarity around that actually does save time and energy over time in a project because you can also divide labor. At certain points you say, I'll work on the ethics application and meanwhile can you go out and start doing X or Y? And you trust in each other enough that you don't both have to be doing both activities. So it can be uh, a labor saving in the end. So, uh, Nicole, in terms of the uh, evaluation, oh, so it, it's probably here. It says, uh, I want to thank Charles <laughs> and Nadine and Colleen for uh, joining us today. And uh, the, the webinar link is, uh, sorry, I'm just going to read it from up there. Uh, oh, uh, so there is a feedback survey. Please ask, uh, <laughs> Please, I'm sorry, I never read this in advance. Please uh, complete the poll on your screen. Uh, for the short answer questions, explain that you only have to enter, enter information on the line. Um, <laughs> type in <laughs> all of your responses and separate each topic with a comma or semicolon. Uh, I want to thank the speakers. I want to thank those of you who joined us today. I'm looking forward to looking back at the webinar and uh, seeing some of the comments and who are here with us today. Uh, the link to the webinar video and additional resources will be sent out within 24 hours. Uh, I'd encourage you to sign up to the Suffice newsletter and that's where you'll find out about future webinars. We will do one on impact of community engagement. The next webinar will be in early December and we'll focus on different models of fostering student engagement in the communities. Uh, within Suffice we have this thing called Pathways to Community Engagement for Students and we're going to look at that and so the details will be sent out through the newsletter as soon as we have them. Thank you all for joining us online and thanks for those of you who are in the room here today.